another really important announcement I forgot to make. Uh, we are working on getting a better camera. So I don't know uh, how many of you have watched our sermons on YouTube, and uh, the quality is not quite what we would like, and especially because a number of people that have come out to the church, they come after having seen some of our content online through social media or through YouTube or whatever, so we want to make sure that we put a good foot forward. We're working on getting a new camera. If you are able to above whatever normal offering you're able to give to the church. If you're able to give some extra for this, we are looking to all together spend for the camera and the rest of the setup for it a little under $2,000, and a thousand of it we're going to take from the fund that we've got for the church right now. If we're able to raise the, the other half a little under a thousand, that would be excellent. Uh, we have had somebody already give an extra offering that we weren't expecting, and so that's going towards the camera. If you're able to give some, please do. Uh, if you do it through cash or check, just write on the envelope camera so we know it's specifically given for that. So we, we're trying to keep track of who gives, or not who gives, but how much is given extra for that camera. So uh, please do that. Or if you give by e-transfer, you can just include in the note Forge Church and then camera there. So um, yeah, I think that was the only announcement that I missed. I appreciate very much all of you being here, especially when it is such a hot day, which will be wonderful for the youth group later, but it's a little tougher right now. As much as we're trying to combat the heat, we're only semi-successful. But anytime that we have a church service where we're a little uncomfortable for whatever reason, my mind goes to a picture I saw years ago of a church, I don't remember what country it was in, it was in South America. But uh, it was their Sunday morning service, and you see people sitting in the pews in an older-looking church, and there's water that's, uh, while they're in the pews, their water is almost up to the person, that, like the waist of the people. And they're gathered in this flooded church to still worship together. And I think that's awesome, and it's, uh, it should be a good reminder to all of us, you know, it's not about the comfort level, it's about who we're gathered to worship. All right. Um, so kids, I won't call you up this morning because some of you are acting more shy than usual lately, and that's okay. But uh, <laughs> as I've mentioned, we are doing a sermon series right now called The Lions, the Witch, and the Queen's Robe, and we've gone kind of out of order. This is the last of the three sermons in this series, and we are focused on the middle part, the witch. So kids, you can, sit where, you can stay where you're sitting, but let me uh, ask you a question. When you think of a witch, what comes to mind? I, I didn't hear, I heard somebody, but I didn't hear what they said. Wizard of Oz? Wizard of Oz? Oh, hold on, let's give the kids a chance to answer first. <laughs> Sor sorcery, is that what you said? Sorcerer. Sorcerer, yeah. Sorcerer, that's a good one. Anybody else have anything? What's, when you think of a witch, what? A black hat? Yes, absolutely. Big pointy black hat, right? Yeah. Don't answer Lena. <laughs> don't ask Lena? Okay. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, here. Warts and green skin. Yes, Gwen? A black cat? Yep, they usually have a black cat with them. That's right. Mothers? <laughs> All right, now we're getting insulting up in here. Okay, let's move to my next picture then, shall we? So, if I can here, how, how are we doing here? Somebody said Wizard of Oz? You read my mind, yes. It's one of the best movies ever made still, in my opinion. Wonderful movie. Um, so, kids, this is what you think of when you think of witches, right? When that, and you see them on Halloween decorations or Halloween costumes and stuff like that. But uh, we're going to look at a Bible story this morning that talks about a witch. But she didn't look like that. The witch that we're going to talk about this morning in the story is visited by the king of Israel. King Saul goes to visit a witch. But this witch looked like a normal person but she tried to use some magic, and we're going to see how that goes in the story this morning. Um, so there's a few people we need to know for the story. 
King Saul and the witch. You can turn to 1 Samuel 28 if you'd like to, to get ready. As we're going to read through it. Few people that we need to know. We need to know King Saul and we need to know the witch. So this is a particular type of witch. This is a, a witch that's called a medium. And a medium is somebody who claims that they can speak to somebody who is dead or speak to dead people. That's what a medium is. Another term that could be used there is necromancer, but uh, the, the board game Dungeons & Dragons has kind of changed the meaning of that word for some people. So we'll just stick with medium or witch. <laughs> so let's look at uh, 1 Samuel 20. Oops, sorry. Yes, we need to know about King Saul and we need to know about the prophet Samuel. So King Saul was the very first king of the country of Israel. And you would think that that means that King Saul is remembered as this great and wonderful guy. He got to be the very first king in this country. But that's not the way it ended up happening. King Saul was chosen by God, and there was a prophet named Samuel. Samuel's another person we do know. Samuel was the one who God chose to go and tell this king, or tell Saul that he was going to be the very first king. And Samuel was a wonderful prophet of God. He did the many amazing things. Saul, on the other hand, not so great. There's a few things that we, we could talk about about Saul. One of them is that he is a full head taller than anybody else in Israel. It mentions that, so he's a really tall guy. Um, NBA player level. But he is, uh, he is not like David. David is the second king of Israel. David is described, despite all of his flaws, David is described as a man after God's own heart. Saul, on the other hand, for a while he follows God. For a while, God tells him through Samuel what to do and that there would be victories when they obey God and all these wonderful things. However, eventually, Saul disobeys. And we read in 1 Samuel chapter 15... I'm going to jump there for a minute so you guys can stay in 28 if you'd like. We read that God had told Saul to lead Israel's army against the Amalekites. The Amalekites were enemies of Israel. They wanted to wipe Israel out. A lot of people throughout history wanted to wipe Israel out. And God had told them, had told Saul through the prophet Samuel, I'm going to give you this great victory. And you're going to destroy them. And you're going to also... What, you, what you're supposed to do is also wipe out the animals and don't bring anything with you. So God is saying the Amalekites are trying to wipe you out. Don't go and defeat them and then bring a bunch of stuff back. Destroy it. The Amalekites, you don't need to bring anything with you. And that is not what Saul did. I'm going to read from Samuel, 1 Samuel 15. Actually, you know what? I'm going to read a few verses from there. So if you want to turn the, a few chapters that way first before we get to our main passage. Because this is what we need to know about Saul before we go on. So Saul says in 1 Samuel 15, and we're going to start at verse 20. Saul says, but I did obey the Lord. Saul said, I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. So Saul is not obeying the Lord, but he's trying to give this excuse and say, but, but I did it for the Lord. I took things I wasn't supposed to take, but I did it for God so that we can make these sacrifices. And here's what God says through the prophet Samuel. He says in verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in, as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So Samuel is saying, God's not buying your excuses. You disobeyed. There's going to be consequences. And the consequence is Saul's family is not going to go on as the royal line of Israel. Because as we know, who takes over after a king dies? His son does, right? His family does. But that's not what happens. After Saul, God said David's going to be king, and that's exactly what happens. 
And it's because of what Saul did here. So that's Saul, and that's Samuel. And the witch we're going to be introduced to shortly. So 1 Samuel 28, flip back there with me, please. And as we're going through, just remember here, verse 23 Samuel had said, for rebellion is like the sin of divination. So he said rebellion is as bad essentially as using witchcraft. And now we're going to skip to what would be years later. And that's what Saul as king is going to try to do. 1 Samuel 28. Uh, Let's read verses 3 to 7. Now Samuel was dead. The prophet Samuel had died. And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, But the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I'd be a witch, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So there's a few things that, uh, so we're going to pause there. There's a few things that I want to, to mention. First of all, this is, Certainly not the first time the Israelites have had to fight the Philistines. The Philistines want to wipe Israel out, like the Amalekites previously had wanted to do. There's a very famous Philistine from uh, a story in the Bible. Does anybody remember a very famous Philistine that David fought? Kids, do you remember? Who did David fight? Goliath. Do you remember last summer? I saw it on that one. You guys got to shoot me with a Nerf gun. We're not doing that this time. <laughs> so, Saul had fought the Philistines before. But this time, he is terrified, and this time, God is not answering him. Um, let me explain a few different things from this passage here as we go. Number one, let's uh, look at some maps. Maps are always exciting and fun, right? Geography. Anyway. This is the kingdom of Saul, the kingdom of Israel under Saul here, this red outline. And it is most of what we know of Israel right now. This is a huge chunk of it. Over here is where the Philistines were. And so what was happening now, we're going to zoom in a bit. We're going to zoom in up to this area here. By the way, if you're ever looking at maps of things from the Bible, here's some good reference points that I like to use. I've mentioned this before. Let me mention it again, though, for those who might not have heard it. Bodies of water. Those are good reference points. So we've got over here the Mediterranean Sea. So if you kept going this way, up here is Europe. Down here is the big boot of Italy. All that fun stuff, right? So here's the Mediterranean Sea. Then we've got two other little bodies of water connected by the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River is mentioned a lot in the Bible, right? Down here we have the Dead Sea. Up here, the smaller one, the Sea of Galilee. So those are some good reference points. We're going to zoom in on this area here. So the Philistines were coming up and around. The Israelites were going up there to meet them because they knew the Philistines were planning to come down and attack. Let's zoom in one more. And this is where we are now. So the Philistines are here at Shunem. Mount Gilboa is here. The Israelites are gathered up to meet them. And here is Endor, also famously a a forest moon that the Ewoks live in. (laughs) Star Wars reference for my fellow nerds there. Anyways... (laughs) So that is uh, how things were looking there. By the way, here is one artist's depiction of this story that we're going to look at. We'll hold on to that for a minute, though. So that's how some of the things were going there. Samuel had died. He was the main prophet that God had spoken to Saul through. Saul is facing an army. He is terrified. He is going to lead his army against them. His life is on the line here. His sons are with him. His sons' lives are on the line here. He is desperate to hear from the Lord. The remaining prophets of Israel, God's not giving them any word for Saul. Saul's hoping God will speak to him through dreams, through visions. God is not speaking to him through dreams or visions. It says God is not speaking to him through Urim. So 
the priests, the uh, holy priests in Israel, they would wear a type of vestment, a uh, chest piece that had different uh, gemstones and things on it. And the Bible says that God would somehow, sometimes answer the people of God's questions through these vestments that the priests wore. We don't know how. I wish that, was, I wish that the uh, details were given to us, but we don't know how. But God doesn't speak to Saul of the Israelites through that. And so Saul is going blind into a battle. I don't know how many of you have been in a physical fight. Um, when I, I've, I've mentioned before, my temper has been an issue for me and in, as I was a young man uh, in particular, and I've been in some fights, and even when you feel confident, it can be scary. And I have never fought a group of people, let alone a group of people coming at me with swords and spears. It's, uh, I can understand Saul's terror here. <clears throat> Something that we need to recognize as we look at this is God doesn't always answer everyone who's seeking information from Him. And that might not be something we're super comfortable hearing. But that's exactly what's happening here. Saul is desperate to hear from God, and God is silent. And there can be a number of reasons why God is not answering us when we seek information from him or pray to him. One of the reasons is sometimes God doesn't give us more information because he wants us to go in faith, right? Abraham was told to go and he went and he didn't even know where he was going. And he's known as a great man of faith. Sometimes that's why God doesn't answer us. Sometimes God doesn't answer people because like Saul, they are under his judgment. Saul is in a place of judgment before God. Not only, by the way, had Saul, this beginning of his downward spiral had started when he disobeyed God, but between that point and where we are now, Saul was trying to kill David. Saul knew David was supposed to be the next king and not Saul's own sons. He didn't like that idea, so he's actively trying to kill the person God had said through the prophet Samuel would be the next king. And so now he's not hearing from God. He should not be surprised by that, right? There's a, a commentary called The Enduring Word. It says, King Saul has rejected and is currently rejecting God's previously revealed will. Since Saul didn't care to obey God in what he already knew, God was not going to reveal more to him. At the very least, Saul knew that God did not want him hunting David, hoping to kill him. If we want God to guide us, so listen to this in particular, if we want God to guide us, we must follow what guidance we already have from him. So if we are actively disobeying God and ignoring the guidance he's given us, we should not be expecting more from him, right? And that's not me saying if you, if you sin at any point, God's going to, you know, never answer you or any of, never give you any guidance because then none of us would ever get that, right? If we sin and then we repent, that is okay and that should be expected. But that's not what was happening here with Saul. He is actively rebelling against God. And of course, it wasn't easy for Saul to find a medium. Repeatedly, the Israelites had been told not to seek out any kind of witchcraft or sorcery. And so Saul previously had been obedient to that and kicked most of them out of Israel, everyone that he could. But now he is actively seeking one. That's how far he's fallen. He's actively seeking out witchcraft in Israel, which he had previously removed. Let me read to you a couple of the passages of the law that the Israelites had from God at this point. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 30, verse 9 to 13 says, When you enter the land your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells or who's a medium or a spiritist who consults the dead. Let me repeat that last part. Nobody should be found in Israel who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Saul knew this. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, it says in verse 12 there. 
Leviticus 20, verse 6 says, And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Now, when it says in an Old Testament law, cut him off from his people, in some cases that means remove them. In some places it means they are to be executed. So these are, this is a very, very serious sin. And this is a national law that the Israelites are supposed to be following under God, who had, who had chosen them as his people, was given them a special place. And this is how, how far, how low Saul had fallen. Let's read verses 8 to 10. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring, for me, bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Okay, let's pause again. So a few things here. So Saul disguises himself goes with only two people to go and see this woman. He is, the king is seeking out this witch. He's doing it in secret. He knows this is wrong. He knows the people of Israel know this is wrong. And so he's going in disguise. He's going with only two people. Kings don't usually travel with such a small regiment of guards here. That's one thing. Another thing is, I don't think this lady is very perceptive. Like I said, it states very clearly earlier in uh, 1 Samuel, Saul is a full head taller than any, anybody else in the nation. So this would be like if our prime minister was a full, foot, or full head or full, full foot taller than anybody else, and then somebody shows up and starts talking to you and inquiring about the best friend of the prime minister. Like, have a little perception here, I guess. Maybe he was hunched over. I don't know. But her concern is, is this a sting operation? Did the, did the king send you here to catch me and to execute me? But here's what's really sad about this little section of the passage. Saul, again, the first king of Israel, the guy who was supposed to lead people in following God, this is how far he's fallen. And this is the last time that we see Saul use the name of the Lord. This is the last time recorded in Scripture that Saul uses the name of the Lord, and what does he use it for? He swears by the name of the Lord that a woman will not be punished for breaking God's law. It's a blasphemous use of the Lord's name. That's how far and deep into sin Saul had fallen. Let's read again verses 11 to 14. Then the woman asked, Whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice. Ah! I don't know if that's the best I got. She's scared. <laughs> she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. So this king goes to see this witch, and what does he want this medium to do? Who does he want to speak with? He wants to speak with his no longer friend, but his old friend, Samuel. Samuel, who had given him guidance from God. And somehow, Saul thinks this is going to work. Saul thinks by directly disobeying a repeated command of God in their law not to speak to medium, somehow he thinks this way he's going to get guidance from God. Sometimes, when we let ourselves fall into sin, our minds can get kind of twisted. We can really justify sin in our own minds. He had done it before when he had taken the animals and claimed they were going to be for, for God's sacrifices, and now he's doing it again. Yes, he's, he's talking to a witch. He's talking to a medium, 
But in his mind, it's, it's okay. He just is doing it to reach the prophet who's going to, in turn, tell him what God wants him to do. It is uh, when, we, when we fall into sin, our minds can get twisted. But this is how desperate Saul is. He wants help. And maybe he had forgotten that Samuel is the one who had proclaimed to him judgment from God on Saul previously. Saul was desperate, and maybe he foolishly thought enough time had passed. There would have been years in between Samuel 15 and this. Maybe he thought enough time had passed that Samuel could convince God to change his judgment or, or something along those lines. Saul is like a man going to a fortune teller to hear the will of God. It just is, it makes no sense. Nonetheless, Samuel does appear. And so, one of the questions that we need to ask is, we need to ask is, uh, are people able to, are people legitimately in the world right now, able to speak to the dead? So there are people nowadays who say they can summon up your dead loved one and you can talk to your dead loved one through this medium. And that's, a, that's what Saul is doing here. Now, let's, first of all, let's talk about the medium here, this witch. Did this witch have actual magical powers? There's two possibilities, really. Now, one is she was just a fraud, because the reality is there's, there's a lot of frauds that claim to have magical powers, that claim to be mediums or psychics or fortune tellers, right? Everybody or most of the adults here, I assume, have heard of a magician named Houdini. Houdini's the most famous magician of all time. He did all kinds of magical tricks, escaped from all kinds of things that were supposed to be inescapable. But he never claimed to have actual magical powers. In fact, he hated it when people did. Houdini's mom had passed away, and Houdini went to a bunch of different supposed mediums and psychics, and he had tried to find somebody who could actually help him speak to his mom, and he never could, and he was enraged by that. And so Houdini spent a lot of his spare time proving that these people were frauds. And I think that there's a good chance that was what was going on with this lady here. She yelled out with a loud voice when she actually saw some, a, spirit, a spirit appearing. I think that might have been her being startled. The other possibility is she did have some sort of supernatural power. But here's the thing. There is nothing in the Bible that in any way indicates a human being can summon up the spirit of a dead person to talk to them. The spiritual forces that are active in this, on this plane right now on earth are either holy, they're either God and his angels, or they're demonic. Demons deceive. It says when Satan lies, he's speaking his native language. He's the father of lies, right? And so it is very, it's a possibility that somebody could be entertaining demons fraudulently pretending to be someone. Could be either one of those. We don't know exactly for sure what's happening here. <clears throat> what we do know is biblically, I don't think anybody could sum up the spirit of a follower of God. God has us. We are his. Nobody can just summon us from him. God is sending Samuel here to deliver one last message to Saul. But it's definitely not the message Saul's going to want to hear. Um, let me mention a few other things here before we move on. One of the things I wanted to talk about is I wanted to give an example of one of the ways that people try and speak to spirits nowadays. There's something called a Ouija board. Kids, you might not have heard of Ouija boards. That's probably a good thing. Adults, you've heard of Ouija boards. People think of Ouija boards as these evil objects. Ouija boards are pieces of plastic copyrighted or trademarked by Hasbro, the board game company. That's what they actually are. The problem is what people use them for. Ouija boards aren't some mystical evil objects. The problem is people are using them to open themselves up to dark spiritual forces by trying to speak to the dead, something we cannot do and which God forbids. We should not be seeking out other spiritual contact other than God. Another interesting thing here is we don't know exactly how it is that when the spirit rises, she immediately, this, this witch immediately recognizes king, the king as Saul. 
But for some reason, that's something that suddenly she realizes who he is. I heard one person teaching on this passage, by the way, here's a very interesting one. I heard one person teaching on this passage who said, this wasn't actually the prophet Samuel appearing to Saul, this was a demon impersonating him. I just thought I'd bring that up because that is a very interesting interpretation and one I don't think at all supported by what's on the text. It repeatedly just calls him Samuel, never identifies him as anything else. And also, what would the point be of a demon appearing and repeating the judgment that God had already said was going to happen on on Saul? doesn't really make sense to me. All right, let's go on to the rest of the chapter. We're going to read verses 15 to 25. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Now, when he says with me, he doesn't mean in God's presence or something like that. He is saying in the grave. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and all that night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life into my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him, and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she had butchered at once. Sorry, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night they got up and left. So yeah, here is the artistic depiction There's oddly not a lot of pictures of this story in the Bible that I could find. This is one of the ones that's on there. And so, this is the message that Samuel gives to Saul. Saul would have been better off not even hearing this, right? If he had not sinned, if he had not gone to seek out words from a witch, help from a witch. But imagine hearing this message from a prophet of God who you know is, is supernaturally in this communication with God, has been accurate in all the prophecies that he's given. By the way, there are people nowadays who claim to be prophets from God and then give prophecies that turn out to be wrong. That's how you know they're a fraud. Anybody that calls himself a prophet, be incredibly skeptical. Doesn't mean it's impossible. God can still do miraculous things. But if somebody gives prophetic words and then they're wrong, that person is a false prophet, right? That is not Samuel. Samuel now, though, gives the word that God is Saul's enemy. Imagine hearing that. God is your enemy. And then hearing, you can't do anything about it, hearing that the next day you and your two sons are going to die in battle. Saul's reaction, I think, is very reasonable collapses, doesn't want to eat. There's nothing he can do. He brought judgment on himself, and this is the result. Samuel says, why have you disturbed me? Samuel's words would be in the mouth of anybody who left, I think, the place of comfort that a follower of God is in after we die. He's like, why did you disturb me? Why did you bring me back here? And then he says, Samuel says, what should I do? If God says he's against you, what is a human being supposed to do to help you at that point? What we can do is give the gospel, but in this circumstance here, 
Samuel's like, what, what are you expecting me to do? Samuel's not God. Samuel never directed God what to do. He just delivered the message that God gave. But Saul didn't really want to hear any kind of truth of what God wanted him to know. Saul wanted reassurance that there was still some way to win, still some way to survive. But Samuel just confirms what God had already said. And by the way, the test for any kind of spiritual encounter is, is it going with what the Word of God says or is it going against it? Right? And it's the same thing when we're going through life. I've heard so many times people talk about how they go through, they give different things that say, conf, that confirm some sort of sinful behavior that they're doing. I had, uh, there was one lady that I heard, she was saying that the sinful behavior she was in, she said, well, I have this deep peace from God about it. And she said, and that's my personal experience. You can't contradict my personal experience. Well, I don't necessarily, I necessarily can't, but does the Bible? Because if we want to know what God's actually telling us, if you're saying something contrary to the Bible, then it is not from God. It's that simple. And so he just, Saul just, Samuel just, I apologize, just repeats, because you did not execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, upon the Amalekites, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. So Samuel is just reminding him, Saul, this was because of you. Saul asked to know what he should do, and Samuel didn't tell him what he should do because there was nothing left to do. All Samuel had to say was God's judgment is already in motion. This woman came uh, to Saul and saw he was troubled, and it's, it's kind of sad to think about this king of Israel collapsed on a floor, unwilling to move, unwilling to eat, and a woman practicing the occult has to comfort the king of the people of Israel. Really, I think she just wanted to get him strong enough to get him out. <laughs> I think she wanted to make sure she's not still going to be executed and get this guy out of her house. Saul left this weird encounter knowing what his fate was and resigned to it. One commentary says, the additional information that within 24 hours he and his sons would be dead was no help at all to his morale, obviously. <laughs> Indeed, he would have been better without it. He did himself no good by doing what he, what he had decreed to be unlawful. God's word stood, and it could not be altered. He should have believed it instead of thinking that by further consultation he could reverse it. The Lord did not answer him because there was no more to be said. Let me wrap up with this. Why is going to a medium or a psychic, or a fortune teller, why is that so wrong? Why is going to a palm reader so wrong? Because at its heart, it is idolatry. We're searching for answers from somewhere else when we should be seeking answers from God. And if God isn't giving the answers, then it's because he doesn't want us to have those answers, or at least not yet. Isaiah 8, verses 19 and 20 says, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter... Should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Should not a people inquire of their God? That is who we should be inquiring of, and if he does not answer, it's because he doesn't want us to have the answer yet. The other thing we need to recognize from this passage is there is a point when God's judgment is decided and final. That had already passed for Saul. He's seeking help in a battle instead of trying to genuinely repent and follow God. That's why God never accepted him back. David, the next king, also committed grievous sins, right? Committed adultery and murder. But he repented. He tried to go back to following God the way he should have been. But there's a point where God's judgment is final. It is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. And that is why the gospel is so important. Because the Bible doesn't say after we die, we get to reconsider our stance on accepting Jesus as our Savior. We have this life to do that. After we die, God's judgment 
on our souls is final. And we do not want to be standing before the judgment seat of God without having Jesus standing there with us. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He said he is the only way to the Father. We need to take that seriously. And we also need to take that seriously in how we are living out our lives and sharing that with the others around us who currently stand as enemies of God. If we are still in our sin, if we have not received salvation from Jesus Christ, we stand before God guilty and we stand before God as, en- as his enemies. We need to take that salvation that we have, use that fire inside of us. We need to spread that to others. They need to be saved. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for all the guidance that you give us in your word. Lord, we know it is an incredible privilege to have the Bible. We have so much immense wisdom, so much immense guidance that we can find right here in your scriptures. And Lord, we know from the very first chapter of Proverbs, fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Lord, I have a respectful fear of you. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we consider this passage. Lord, that you would remind us as Christians regularly that we need to seek guidance from you before we make decisions, before we act. We need to turn to you in prayer, Lord. Please remind us, please help us to have that on our hearts and minds. And Lord, we also know that without Jesus Christ, without the cross, we stand before your judgment. And Lord, we know so many people around the world, so many people that we love still stand under your judgment. I pray, Lord, that you would move their hearts, their souls with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would equip us, Lord, that you would give us the words, that you give us the passion to share our, our faith with others. And Lord, that you would give us that opportunity. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.